Can you hear us? I'm going to make you a co-host as well. I'm just going to fill up my water before we start and then... Your background <laughs> looks fab though. I'm also surprised that there's anyone in the waiting room. Ooh. Okay. Ready? Wait. Hello everyone, welcome and thank you for joining us. Um, it looks like we've got people kind of logging in from all over the world. Morning from Canada again. Still morning here. <laughs> Hi Susan, lovely to see you. Hello. Hi again from Orlando, where it's 90. Oh, oh. gosh. <laughs> wow. I am Sonia. This is Helena. Um, and today we have got a wonderful special guest, which is Lola from Third Vault Yarns. Hello. <laughs> um, um, Lola has dyed some absolutely delightful yarn for our open weekend as a special. They are such, um, I think your characteristic is these like incredibly bright, saturated tones. We thought it would be great to have a chat. Um, this is quite an informal chat. So if anyone has any questions, you can either, there's like a raise a hand button that you can do, or you can just type it into the chat without further ado. I think we'll hand it over to you, Lola. Thanks for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. But yes, so I'm Lola. I am the dyer and designer behind Third Vault Yarns. And what I tend to do is Third Vault Yarns usually produces colorways that are inspired by science science fiction and fantasy themes because I am a massive nerd and I love to bring the things that I love into the things that I produce and basically show and sell to everybody. So I like to bring in fantasy themes, science fiction themes from books, TV, film, everything, board games and uh, yeah, video games. It's everything that I enjoy doing. I love to share with everybody. And I was really excited to kind of bring a little bit of that geekiness into what I was doing for the mill this time with my drawing from like film and TV. The slightly more exotic fruits that, um, such as the African horned melon, which is also called Kuwano. So this colorway was inspired by the horn melon. However, it was after a little bit of a deep dive on the interwebs, looking for different fruits that appeared in fantasy. And I picked from Star Wars, where you have the Maroon, Maroon fruit. And then I did a little, more, a little bit more digging and I realized that the Kuwano fruit was actually um, featured in, I think, Avengers Endgame with Thanos. And so I was like, well, how could I not, Amazing. for example? And it is such a, um, it does just look out of this world, the fruit. I would well recommend people Google it if they're not familiar with a horned melon. Yeah. And the color you've made is just, it really sums that melon up to a yeah. T. It's like, bright orange and yellow and it's got these like lime green seeds doesn't yeah it? yeah and it's funny that it's the pair I haven't tasted it myself but apparently it tastes like a cross between banana and cucumber like a very light touch of banana <laughs> that's a very odd combo <laughs> but it's very refreshing apparently and then of course we have dragon fruit which, well, I mean, any fruit that has dragon in the name is obviously going to be an obvious choice. So, of course, it's this bright pink with plum and lime on the white. I have to apologise, my camera is a bit crap, so you can't really see what the colour really looks like. But, yeah, I just, I really loved the different var varieties of dragon fruit. And, well, it's also called pitaya. And... I love the different varieties and colors, which are a mix between this rich pink, 
like reddy color and like these little leaves of green that shoot off the outside and then the flesh on the inside is either this is white with like black speckles or you get this really really rich kind of maroony inside it's a different variety so i just i just really want to wanted to bring that into a colorway oh and it beautiful. looks like we've got our first question which is okay. great from um louise um so what fandom are you currently most excited about um oh. she is reading robin hobb uh the farseer trilogy and the live ship traders trilogy i've put you on the spot so maybe a <laughs> no no it's, it's a tricky question because i love so many things and i'm also really bad at keeping up to date with things so for example i just caught up with the latest season of the expanse so and that came out last september or something like that i i'm so bad i'm yeah. so bad at that but also i haven't i haven't picked up a book in three weeks and that's terrible for me because i read like 500 books a year or more like I read a lot a lot a lot uh so I haven't picked up a book in a while so I, I can't tell you what at I'm reading currently though um I think the latest ones that I read were the St Mary's Chronicles by Jodie Taylor and that is all about exploring history in contemporary time i.e time travel so that one's quite fun I've, I've been listening to a lot of D and D podcasts, so Dungeons and Dragons role playing game podcasts, yeah. and that's been inspiring a lot of my yarn and colorways recently. So a couple of ones that I did for Unravel, um, those were inspired by my um, my love of the Venture Maidens podcast, which is an all um, Femme and non-binary podcast, which is Dungeons and Dragons in a kind of homebrew world, which is something that the dungeon master, the person that's leading it, has created. And all together, they're telling a story. And it, this colorway, Cottle, was inspired by it. So I'd, I'd like to um, take inspiration from lots of things. And I'm listening to a million things at the moment. So do what um like started do you remember one of the first things that was like super influential into your like sparking your imagination with fantasy and sci-fi in the like when you were a kid do you remember what kind of mm -hmm. was the first in for you I don't know because it's one of those things that it feels like it's always been a massive part of my life it's kind of living and breathing it almost I think I remember as a kid going to see the Star Wars, uh, was it the first? No, I don't remember what the first one of the second set of three is called, but I remember going to see those as a kid and really enjoying them and that having a big influence. And I guess just everything with, I really, I've always loved the idea of um, space and kind of looking outside of our world and I think a lot of it has kind of drawn me to that as an element and also just kind of I love to kind of be influenced and, and explore all of these other things outside of what we have in reality so it just made sense for me and yeah that's all the way through I have basically been um in, lo in love with sci-fi and fantasy and it was definitely a massive feature of my book reading like I blazed through the children's library and then I was sneaking up to the adults library to like grab new books because what else was I gonna do for like my evenings <laughs> yes. especially if you're reading 500 a year <laughs> I mean I was a little bit slower as a kid <laughs> a little bit on a day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah I would I I preferred reading to sleeping so I would often kind of get a knock on my door because my light was still on and my parents were like go to bed you have to go to school <laughs> do you go directly from inspiration to dive pot or do you have an in-between process that was from Elaine 
It varies, very much varies with uh, different colorways. Sometimes um, for specific inspirations, maybe if I've read something in a book and I can see it really clearly in my head, or I'm, I'm trying to capture a thing that I very much kind of go, hmm, I see these colors in my head and then I think, okay, so how do I translate that it into something that I feel rings true for that inspiration? Because I'm when I die, I'm very I'm very intentional about how I want it to work up for the most for the most part, as well as how I want it to look as a general skein, for example. So I'll kind of get the color in my head and then I may take some time to play around with mixing the different dyes to get those specific colors. Once I have that color made up, then I'll go, okay, so this is how I want to see it, which means I'll have to dye it in this particular style or it needs to go in this style and that's gonna be a lot more variegated or tonally variegated, or it's gonna be kind of a semi-solid with like tonal hints of other colors and things like that. Could you just give us a bit of a rundown on like all of the different methods you use to dye? Cause I think that was one of the things that I was most intrigued by when we started emailing back and forth about this collaboration is you were like, well, I could use this method or I could use that one or I could use this one. And this is how that would affect the colors. And that was like very new to me. So I'm sure other people would love to hear that as well. Like what are your different methods and which one do you turn to for different effects? Yeah, of course. Um, so I have I use a couple of different methods. Um, I use a lot of uh, resist dyeing, which is essentially um, what I've used for the uh, two colorways for the limited edition um, ones for the sh uh, for the weekend for the open weekend, um, and that is essentially creating a resist in the skein to limit how much of the yarn um, takes up the specific color. And I like to use that to create um, a style of yarn that is, yeah. So this example, this is for example, a resist dye colorway. Oh, could you hold it just a little bit closer, please? Of course. Perfect. Thank you. So what that does is tends to create a fabric for knitting and crochet. I can't find my crochet samples. Um, it creates a fabric that gives you a kind of tonal um, flow of color. So it kind of brings all the colors together as well as um, letting the individual colors pop. But it also means that you're, you're unlikely to get large pooling sections of color. And I quite like to kind of bring that in for some things that I want to be, want it to kind of blend, but also pop at the same time. So for that one, for example, is from my newest collection. And that is, um, that one I wanted kind of the purple to pop as well as white, but also being a really kind of nice overall color. So fat resist dyeing is one method that I use. Um, so this one is, um, this one's called Fade of Devotion. And this is dyed in such a way that you have, it, it's almost hand painted. So you've got the colors kind of traveling to a different kind of color, but almost in a little bit of a gradient across the skein. And for this, you kind of get flashes of different colors and you can get some pooling depending on what, um, what circumference, what gauge, or whatever you knit or crochet it up in. But I, I like to use that method for something that visually I want it to kind of translate through all of them and give you that kind of flashing in that respect. So that's hand painting. Uh, then this is another example of a different method of dyeing. So this one is kind of a mixture between kind of 
liquid pouring and speckles and playing around. It's literally just laid in a tray and then I'll pour the different colors on top of it to kind of give the effect that I want. And for this, because the colors are quite random, it also works up a little bit like the, um, the other colorway swatch that I made up, obviously with the speckles adding little tiny pops of color. So I like to play between those. Yeah, I also use um, a low water immersion technique and that is with different dye powders and then adding water at the same, like over it. I haven't grabbed an example of that, unfortunately, but actually I don't need to because I have this. So this one is a low water immersion dyed colorway where I've put the different dye powders on and then added water to it. And what that does is that it creates little sections where you have the distinct color and then it lets the colors blend together in different ways. So this one is quite a heavily variegated colorway, but because they're all, all sort of in the same family, it still gives you a kind of tonal aspect. And this one is another one of the apple door colorways that I dyed. And this one's called Harvest. <laughs> so it will also be available for me. To you, isn't yes. it? So people will need to head over to your website um, and do pop your website in the chat as well. Because oh, I'm sure people will want to just have a little look at all those amazing colors you've got. So. Yes. so music for me, it tends to be, or at least as I've gotten older, tends to be something that I use to um, kind of be in the background and help me focus <laughs> so that um, it, keep, it occupies part of my mind whilst I'm then creating. So I think that perhaps it does sometimes influence how I'm dying on a particular day, especially, or what I choose to die that day, because it, it tends to influence my mood in that way. However, I don't necessarily take inspiration from a particular um, piece of music unless it's already in something that I'm watching like for example um okay I'm, I'm gonna take Lord of, the, Lord of the Rings as an example purely because um that has some really wonderful musical scores but it does um, yeah. I used to listen to that a lot about yeah. while doing homework <laughs> and I think that some of those some of those songs have definitely added some influence to my work. Like I did, I did the fellowship quite a while ago and I, I am looking at doing some more Lord of the Rings colorways, but I think some of the songs that were written for the, um, for the books and things like that and hearing them, I think that they also will have some influence in that. Some more technical questions now. Sure. We've got, uh, what do you use for your resist product, and what are the yarns you use for that? Okay, so for resisting the yarn itself, like just twisting it up, essentially, twisting it up and like pouring the water over the dye water over it, because the yarn essentially resists itself, especially if you're using a superwash yarn. If you're using a non-superwash yarn, like the mill ones, you have to make sure that the yarn is already wet before you uh, layer another color. And they're laughing because I told them that's why I have this colorway. <laughs> because I was creating this colorway and I forgot to make this wet before I put the lime green over it. So I ended up with uh, several lime green skeins that I was like, I think I'll better over dye that. <laughs> well, you've made a beautiful yarn. Yeah, I love that colour. <laughs> I might be getting one myself. Yeah. And um, what bases I use. So I'm quite particular about the bases that I use. I get them from a range of places, but um, I work quite closely with Andrew from Warm Tops, who I know supplies some of the fibre for the mill because it's absolutely gorgeous and it's really well done. And uh, like some of them, I even get uh, the melter spin for me. <laughs>
and that is honestly one of my favorite bases and I'm really happy to have the same the same wool yarn now for my um four ply as well because it's just this absolutely gorgeously soft and squishy yarn but oh do you have a sample of it kicking about that you could show us or don't worry if not just I mean there's yarn everywhere <laughs> okay well I I do I do but you have to promise to keep it a secret because I'm not supposed to show anybody so we've got some secret yarn so this is the worsted spun yarn that the little does for that me. Falling of red there, those reds. Yeah. So it's like the speckles there. But it's just this really plump, squishy yarn that is absolutely gorgeous for hats, cowls. I'm making a jumper in it for myself. That I would literally use it for everything. <laughs> which is also because I'm a big fan of knitting with thicker wools. It's quicker, right? <laughs> oh yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> it's quicker, it's got that little love of instant gratification and um, my hands prefer thicker wools. Like if it gets too small and too small needles, then my fingers will cramp. <laughs> yeah. Do you use hand spun or is it just commercial spun? I mostly use commercial spun. I there might be something coming up with hand spun sometime <laughs> in the future. Exciting. Maybe. But uh, yes, I use commercial spun wolves today. What is it that you look for in a base? Like, is it just something that you think is gonna be is it the same things you look for in terms of like um working up the project, or is there a specific aspect sometimes to things that you're like that's going to be fun to die on. Like, are they two different kind so, of bit of brain firing or is it the same? So I think that both of those things influence um, my yarn based choices. Uh, primarily it's what is it like to work with and how does it take dye? Mm -hmm. Because I like to work with my Facebook group in that um, often when I bring in a new base or I'm looking to bring in a new base, I will, basically shout about it in my group and be like, hey, who wants to test these bases and give me some feedback? Because I really like knowing the, um, the bases that I choose, especially when I bring them in, work for a large range of people. And I like to know, is this something that you would pick? Is this something you wanna work with? That kind of thing, as well as something that I wanna work with myself. Like for example, this jumper, I love it. It is in my blue face Leicester base and it's so comfortable. I'm currently wearing it right next to my skin because yeah, it, it's really important to me that I have yarns that I want to work with and I want to wear. Yeah. yeah. That's a lot of what we go for as well. Like Appledore is we wanted something that was a bit more crispy and then we wanted all of the crazy bright colors. So that's yeah. what we made. Yeah. 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 And I guess that's one Sorry. of the things, like, obviously, as a hand dyer, you can pick and choose from lots of different bases, whereas we are bound to a degree by what our machines will physically be able to produce. Um, yeah. Like, we couldn't do, for instance, we couldn't do, like, a brushed mohair just because we don't have a, you need a really specific machine to make that. Yeah. We don't have one. Um, but we're definitely always trying to have a different variety of how does it feel. And that's one of the joys, you know, because I imagine you must do a lot of dyeing. So being able to dye on things that are different textures keeps it fresh as well, doesn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Sorry. I think that's <laughs> my house ring. I'm just going to ignore it and I apologize to everybody. Um, yes, absolutely. Um, I do have quite a different, few different textures to dye on. And I love, I love having that range, especially because I'm really a big fan of being able to use different fibers and different bases for different things. Like the yarn that I would rec um, recommend for different projects, for example, what I would use in socks and hats and gloves versus what I would use for jumpers and things like that. That tends to vary. 
And I am a huge fan of using more robust yarns for socks and um, and gloves and things like that because they will get a lot of wear and be kind of subject to a lot of um, friction. So I like to choose yarns that have that robust quality as well as that kind of good next to skin fill. <laughs> But yeah, I, I like to go for something a little bit crisper for those example. So, oh, this is a really good question, um, which is what advice would you give to someone who wants to learn to dye? Play around. Like that's that's a hundred percent my biggest um, kind of and like the best piece of advice that I can give you. I have spent so like a long time playing around before I started that Volt Yarns, I'd been dying for a year and a half. I, I taught myself how to dye yarn to actually teach other people as part of my university um, uh, stitch and bitch. And a big thing was playing around with what I like to see, how I like dyeing the yarn, like playing around with lots of techniques. And there are so many um, videos on dyeing online, on YouTube and everything else. So there's a lot of information out there on how to do things, but basically play around, figure out what you like, what style is the thing that you find the most fun or many styles that you want to play with. And I think for me, that's generally what has been the thing that keeps me loving what I do. And I use a lot of different styles because I like playing with that. And also it's very important to me that when I'm thinking of something or translating an inspiration to yarn, that I use a style that kind of speaks to me in the same way. So play around, figure out what you like, figure out how you want to play with your diet. Um, your dyes and the techniques you want to use and the saturation that speaks to you, the way you want to incorporate your colors and everything else. It's a learning process, but it's also about having fun with it. Yeah, definitely. And I've just popped a note in the chat there, which is if you're looking to start dyeing, um, I've just put a link to... Um, Andrew, who, which is where you've said you get quite a lot of your yarn from. Yeah. And he also, he supplies us with fiber. So he is a wool agent and he's fabulous. And he is also Absolutely. one of our special guests, I think on Sunday, is it? Yes, Sunday morning, he's chatting to John. So yeah. You should all come back and listen to that. Come and listen to that if mm -hmm. you're interested in fiber. But if you want to have a go with, um, you know, dying on some natural bases, picking them up from him is a great kind of, place to give it a go different fibers take dye differently that's just a fact of life really and like if i'm if i'm dying the same thing and i, I tested out all the apatol colorways on the expo zoc for example as another base and they're completely different because obviously the expo zoc is also um super washed which it also impacts how um, the, the dye take up and how quickly it strikes. So for example, like see, I'm in danger of running on. Um, so for example, wool bases, like pure wool bases will take color in a kind of very rich and way, especially if they're super washed, they will take the, the dye in a way that strikes very a lot and very quickly. Uh, wool bases, sub, but some wools, for example, like this is, yeah, so this one is 100% merino. And I don't know if you're going to be able to see the differences on screen, but this is the 100% merino. And this is the BFL um, nylon. So the difference is. The same color. Yeah, they're the same colorway, but. I don't know if you can see the differences. The way this has taken the uh, the colors is it's blended them more and it's created a much softer flow whilst for this one, and they're both super washed, this one has kind of made the colors a lot more distinct. 
Mm. So that's how, for example, these two bases die. And it looks very subtle on camera, but it's something that I notice a lot when I'm actually dying. And of course, that is just an example of dying on white yarn. Whilst if you're dying on yak, camel, or any other bases that have color already from the original color of the fiber, that will also impact how it, that will also impact how it takes up the color and what the underlying color does. It will impact the richness of how it takes up and it can also change the color. So for example, if you're gonna dye a yellow on a gray base, you'll get a richer green or things like that. But as I said, I could talk about, about this. For... Also, on plant-based as well, you've got a bamboo, yeah. which is very different again, isn't it? Yeah, of course. And I'm still kind of working out ways to kind of give you the same sort of effect on my plant bases because those are yarns that um, require time to set the color and like and just kind of continue so you kind of have to leave it in those colors for quite some time whilst with um, wool dyeing you can kind of be like okay so I've got this color and I need it to go on these parts of the skein and I need it to set and exhaust and that will do it much quicker than say a plant fiber yarn which I have to leave for 24 hours for example. Is that because it's not hollow then so it just takes a lot longer to absorb into like the so it's it's actually not that it's not taking it's it's not that it's taking the time to absorb because it will absorb it really quickly it's actually the time taken for the chemical reaction to actually complete and bind so um you you use a mordant as, as with all in all dyeing so with wool and protein fibers it is acid and heat whilst in um, for cellulose fibers like plant fibers you would use soda ash. So you use an alkaline solution for that. And the process with those and the dyes doesn't necessarily, you don't necessarily have to use heat. There are specific um, hot water reactive dyes versus like Procyon and like um, standard dyes, which are cold water process. But it's generally that it needs the time for it to react all together and create that fine bond whilst wool tends to need a lot less time to do that. Sorry, this has got very technical, very oh, fast. Fascinating. <laughs> fascinating. I'm learning some new stuff. Yeah, <laughs> I'm so loving it. Awesome. I'm sure other people will be as well. So this one here, this is the um, Kiwano, but I can't remember what it's called, but the, oh, uh, it's sorry. <laughs> yeah so this kind of teal beautiful color like so yeah but I mean Helena knows me and how much I adore teal as a color in general and I mean if you look at my shop you'll probably see a lot of teal kind of <laughs> related yarns <laughs> but yeah so that's one of my favorites I also love some of the kind of gray style head like the neutrals with the heathers because there's some gorgeous like pinks like shooting through them as well and those are really lovely i also love i can't remember what it's called again but it's a really colorful one that's a little bit like the um cotton candy once you did i think or the tutti it's a little bit like the tutti fruity kind of yeah. style but it's still a lot soft it's quite punchy and i also really like that one yeah. And do you want to show us, you've got some gorgeous yarn behind you there, so why don't you show us some more, some more of your samples? This one is Crown of Flame, which is a new, another colorway from my new collection. But yes. Pinks and reds and oranges? Yeah, it's, it's got these, um, it's got really soft pink hiding in there, as well as like peaches and golds and kind of reds and oranges as a color. What is the inspiration for that one, Lola? So this collection was inspired by the Graceling trilogy. So it's a, a not, sorry, not trilogy, Graceling Realm series of books by Kristen Cashel. So both of these two are two of the colorways from the collection. So you've got 
um, Crown of Flame and Storm's Eye. So these two. Lovely. And those are like tonally variegated colorways that kind of flow together whilst also having little pops of the different colors. And this one I think I showed earlier is Fate of Devotion, which is also another, bo another book inspiration. I cannot remember the author of the book, but um, this one was specifically inspired by, I think, the colors on the front cover, for example, of this. It's like book. a pride of paradise or yeah. something. It's just, it's so lovely and saturated. Yeah, so that one's quite fun. And the book itself is called Fate of Devotion. This one with speckles and like splashes of the blue over the silver. This one is called Cassiopeia, or I don't know how to pronounce it maybe, <laughs> so yeah. But yeah, just wanted to um, kind of play with some of the colors that I use for speckling in a different colorway, but also something that kind of takes us kind of back away from earth and back into the sky yeah. and space so the constellation really but yeah so i have like a mixture of colors i didn't twist this one up very well <laughs> but this one is um the unsleeping city which is as i said i think earlier if you were here is inspired by a dungeon of dragons podcast called dimension 20 and the series is The Project. Unsleeping City. It's really nice. That's, oh, that's one of my faves, I think. <laughs> and I just saw a question pop up about uh, whether I end up keeping uh, colorways in my personal stash. I'm not telling you, Stanley. So <laughs> <laughs> that's why you had to start the shop, right? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> We're the same here, it's rather dangerous. Then every now and then you bring things back in and you're like, actually, mm. no. <laughs> That's it, made up. I know you do, um, you do quite a bit of designing as well. So I do. that I hat, do. Um, for anyone yes. who didn't realize, is one of Lola's own personal designs as well. Yeah. It's so this the traveling table. Yeah. So I'm, I'm currently a massive fan of um, slip stitch cables. And this one is in the Appledore yarns. And it was one that I was working on because I wanted to kind of bring that orchard kind of feel. So you've got some bushes and a nice tree for the um, for kind of apple orchard kind of style. And then of course I have some of the, well, a couple of samples from the two books that are kind of hiding over here. I've got oh, volume one and two of Board Game Nets, which uh, includes yarns from, this one includes yarns from myself and also the wonderful mill, because as you can see, it's from me and Helena. <laughs> so, yeah. We came up with lots of fun little patterns based on board games we love. Yes, like I think we um, we met through knitting and then realised we both loved board games and so ended up going to various board game things together and I wanted to create a collection of based on things that I love again and so Board Game Knits was born. So there's this book and I've got one or two samples from that including this one, this fun kind of scarf, which is inspired by Kaplunk. <laughs> so it's uh, like a long one in a kind of, uh, I don't know how to, I don't know what to call the shape, but it's, um, it's kind of a diamond shape, an elongated diamond. Yeah. Is Kaplunk the one with the sticks? Yes. Sticks, and then you pull the sticks out and then all the marbles go and it's like, ooh. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> so that's, um, so all of these kind of little stripes are to symbolize the sticks. This section is all your, all the lace is for the marbles. 
that drop if you take out the six. And this is because of the, the shape was inspired by the shape of the Kaplunk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ah. So that shawl is Kaplunk. And um, yeah, there, there are loads of, um, of patterns in the book. There's nine in the first, nine in the second. And this one here that's kind of hiding behind me is the Monopoly shawl. So a game of chance. And it's got kind of little motifs in it. Uh, yeah, it's got little motifs, including the chance symbol at top, like the little um, thing here for waterworks. So it's got a little tap. <laughs> and at the bottom, you've got these bulbs, these light bulbs for electricity. But you can also, in the pattern, you can choose um, what symbols you want to use, and you can put that in the chart yourself. And then, of course, we've got book two, which was launched last year, which Helena also like did some patterns for. Let's see, which my brother was kind enough to model. <laughs> this is Helena's pattern. Yeah, and that's in our Yana Delicate X More Soft, yeah. which are the brightest colours we do. Yep, <laughs> nice and fun. And yeah, so this book is uh, came out last November, which was kickstarted by the help of possibly even some of you, <laughs> if you joined. And my favorite pattern from that book is this shawl, the Age of Wonder shawl. Beautiful. Yeah. It's probably my first big lace shawl pattern, but I have now caught the bug, so there might be more. <laughs> but yeah. So this one, obviously, it's inspired by um, the, the board game, Age of One, uh, no, Seven Wonders, based on Seven Wonders of the Ancient World. So the way you play the game is in three ages. So there are three sections. And for those, I picked three different wonders. And this one is um, based on the pyramids of Giza. Yeah. And so you've got these little motifs here. It's a little bit too dark to see them, but it's um, little motifs that are um, pyramids. And then here in this section, you've got some drop stitch lace and cables. And these were, this was inspired by the Temple of Artemis. So you've got those pillars and the top that's separated by the, like the lateral braids. And finally, you have the Hanging Gardens of Babylon. Ooh, so three awesome. different leaf shapes. Yeah. And uh, it's made up of, it's three ages. So three kind of distinct different wonders and seven sections across the shawl and the book I think is something that is so special because it's also another collaboration not just with Helena but with several other designers and dyers and all of them have put a lot of effort and work into their patterns and it was just really lovely especially during the height of the pandemic um, to still be working together and talking to everyone and collaborating and creating something so special and amazing and also the amount of help and support that we had from everyone during that is it's something that makes me so happy and so like just it brought me a lot of joy to create it and bring it to all of you last year but yeah there are still books available in the shop and uh, yeah <laughs> it's really fun as well to see how other people take the same prompts and go and find different things like some of the others in the second book picked games that I'd never heard of and so it's like oh what are they playing let's go have a look and then you know have they translated it like you know you've done seven sections and three different things and yeah it's like how did they do it because my chameleon cowl is just the box that that game in is just those luminous bright colors so it's just like it's just like I said it's a representation of the box for the game but then yeah other people have picked different things to yeah. yeah, I'm trying to find a full picture of Verity's pattern, like a full page picture, but I can't. But this one, for example, is based on the um, board game Sagrada. And that is a game 
that has, um, well, you can kind of see it a little bit. It has different colored dice and you're creating these stained glass windows. So it was just really interesting to see how everyone um, interpreted and took um, took their inspiration to make a different um, pattern. Like, again, this one is another one of mine. It's the uh, yeah. Settlers Myths, which is based on the Settlers of Catan. So you've got, you've got many options of how you can do it, but you've got like textured hexes as well as color work, so. It's quite fun. We've yeah. been playing a lot of board games in our. Ha I mean, we played board games pre-pandemic, but mm. now since COVID, we definitely um, we've got an ever expanding. We had to buy a new bookshelf to fit them. <laughs> yeah, it's not like my bookshelf is taken up by board yeah. games or anything. No. Yeah. Well, I have a bookshelf full of books, and because it like. As I said earlier, I read a lot of books and like go through so much that my parents, to stop me from buying physical books, bought me a Kindle for Christmas. <laughs> You're cluttering up the house. Yes, essentially. <laughs> it's like there's not enough space for your books. So I now have a Kindle. So that means that there's more space for my board games. The question that I saw was about what brand of acid diet I'd recommend for beginners. And um, uh, Debbie Tonkri's craft and design, they do little starter packs. So that's a good place to, especially if you're kind of starting out and want to get um, some like small little things of professional dyes, give it a go. If you're planning to do this with children or you're going to do it in kitchen and you're using the same things as, um, as you would use for cooking, i.e. pots and everything else, use food coloring. <laughs> like use Wilton, um, Wilton's food coloring because you do not want to use powder dyes um, with any anything that you lose for food because they are somewhat toxic. So especially if you're going to use powder dyes, make sure you have a respirator, make sure you're wearing gloves, always be safe. <laughs> Very good advice. I use dye from a lot of different places. A lot of people use, um, so from Dharma Trading in the States, but there are some UK stockists of that dye. Um, Saltwater Threads is a good UK stockist of, um, uh, of Dharma, Dharma dyes. And um, I also, they, Colorcraft does dye as well. So I use one or two of their colors. And I also use Chemtex dye, which is, um, a Regency FCB dye and those, but those come in much bigger pots and those are much more kind of professional dyes, I'd say, but they do give really great colors. And that is the one place that I found that does a red, that is actually red. <laughs> what color are they usually then the reds? Like pink, pink. or? Pink or orange, it's like, so, okay. I say red that is actually a red. There are a million different types of red. There are a million different types of every, other color but um to get that kind of that's a bad example <laughs> i was gonna grab it but to get that kind of rich red that i see here that doesn't lean too orange or too pink it's they that's where i get mine from and it took me a really really long time to find one that I was happy with because I'm very particular about specific um, like colors and things like that. I don't know if any of you've watched some of my IG lives, my Instagram live things, or I've now put them up as um, like I, um, IGTV videos on my Instagram profile, but I did, I did some dyeing last year when I was dying from home in the first lockdown here in the UK. And I think there is one where I was, um, there, I'm all creating colorways, but there was one that I was doing one of the mystery study um, colorways where people had voted on specific color palettes. Mm -hmm. So I was looking at the color, pa uh, color palettes and going, okay, right, this color, I think 
it speaks to me of a mix of these two particular colors and then I would mix them up and go mm, okay not quite and then add a little bit of something else and so I, I tend to do that a lot like <laughs> I remember when I was doing a collaboration with Angie from Gamer Crafting because we do we, we do a few and I was in her kitchen and we were looking at the expense and I was like nope that moment that particular moment with Avasarala I was like, yeah, that yellow. And I, I took about 20 minutes to mix that specific color that I wanted, but it was perfect. It just <laughs> took me forever. <laughs> These things take time sometimes. Some <laughs> rush genius, right? <laughs> she spent half that time staring at me going, that, that's not how I die. <laughs> Everyone does it differently. Yeah. Uh, Debbie said, can you recommend a purple dye? What kind of purple? <laughs> <laughs> that, that, I think that's a colour that really has such a broad. Yeah. Like, uh, I don't know. I use so many. Like I've got, I've literally got eight different pots of purple dye on my on my dye shelf, and I, we're not in my studio today. We're at home, but. Um, yeah, I could show you my rack of dyes. It literally goes from, it's about a meter and a half long and it's organized in the colors of the rainbow because that's the easiest way to grab dyes from. And I have five different pots of yellow, six different reds, several browns, like different greens, different blues. Like there's, there's so many different colors of everything else. Like, uh, for example, a really good plum that like I get that from Chemtex as well. Like maroon, I also get from Chemtex. Um, Imperial, like a rich royal kind of purple. That's from Dharma. Like I, I use lots of different brands and like to bring it all together as much as possible. And then I also spend a lot of time mixing. Like a good, a good way to get purple is using a turquoise and a magenta, like a properly bright pink. So, and then like playing around with different, um, what's the word? Different amounts of each of that dye powder or like adding a little bit more red or adding a different blue mm -hmm. to kind of give you different shades of purple. Sometimes it's worth just playing around with blending the one to get the purple that you want. Yeah. Lots of fun things to try out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Food for food for food. <laughs> thoughts. There we go. Finally made it. <laughs> well, and fluff for dying. Thank you so much again, Lola, for um, joining us, and thank you for making this amazing yarn we've got here. It's absolutely beautiful. Some of it may have to come home with me at the end of the day. Yeah, so <laughs> Becky has sent me her colorways as well. And I'm like, do, do I have to, do I have to sell They are gorgeous too. Yeah. They, they are, are gorgeous, gorgeous too. Yeah. See, so yeah. look, all together. Beautiful. Yeah. So for anyone who's interested in snagging some yarn, um, I will just pop um, the link right in the chat. Or of course, you can um, get it straight from Lola as well. And we have to go now because we have to yeah, go yeah. set up for the next chat. But um, thank you again, Lola. And it's been such a treat. So thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you for coming by and saying hello and asking questions and everything. Thanks for having me. <laughs> thank you, everyone. Thanks so much for joining. Okay. Farewell. Bye.